Hey guys, BJ with Very Basic Bible. We're going to do a lectionary study. Some of you, BJ, what's a lectionary? I'm glad you asked. It's a set schedule of scripture readings. You schedule some for certain scriptures to read one week, then certain ones to read the next, then the next, then the next, the whole calendar for the whole year. It's all laid out. Uh, the one, since I'm a part of the Methodist Church, I have the Revised Common Lectionary, okay? Um, and there's a one-year cycle, a three-year cycle, okay? I basically just click on Revised Common Lectionary. I look at the scriptures there, then I go for them. So what's good about doing this whole lectionary thing? Why not just choose what random scriptures? Why are we, like, going with these specific ones? Here's what we do. We take the scriptures that were given. Okay, we don't choose our own. Sometimes God just gives us stuff. We take the scriptures we're given. We apply the Bible study tools that we've learned in the past, whether they're Bible. You want to let's say you let's say you uh, just study the Bible on your own. Let's say all you've had ever is Sunday school. What if you watch BJ's very basic Bible videos? What if you've been to seminary? Okay, take your Bible study training from the past and we'll apply it to these scriptures. Okay. Here we go, guys. Share screen. There we go. Revised Common Lectionary. So, and a lot of my very basic Bible videos, I go painstakingly, detailingly, annoyingly slow through Bible verses. Thus says the Lord, says, what would it be like if the Lord says, let's look at that word, wait, what, you know, I don't, I don't know Greek or Hebrew, but I just go really slow. Well, in these lectionary readings, instead, we'll read through, and then we'll just say, hey, what do we think it means? We'll try to go a little quicker. Remember, very basic Bible is everything before the theology. In lectionary readings, since I'm not necessarily explaining it, but I'm trying to take what we've learned in the past and apply it to the scriptures here, I might get a little theology in there, but mostly we're just trying to figure out how to read it. Isaiah 43, 16, 21. Psalm 126. Philippians 3, 4b through 14. John 12, 1 through 8. As you can see, the revised common lectionary, the fifth Sunday in Lent, year C, we got three years. You go through the entire Bible in three years. If you preach to every Sunday or whatever day your church service might happen to be, most are Sundays, then if you preach the whole lectionary every year, then in three years, you would have preached most of the Bible because some scriptures are left out. You know, I would say like find those scriptures that they leave out and make sure you get them in there. Okay, guys, let's for this week. April 3rd, here are the ones they give us. Start Isaiah 43, 16 through 21. All right. Thus, here we go. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to go give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Let's go put this sucker in the parallel Bible. What was it? Isaiah. Isaiah. 43, 16 through 21. Isaiah 43. Okay. Got our seven Bible translations here. Seven right there. All right. Let's read in the NASB. 43, 16 through 21. Isaiah 43. 
Hey, I just saw something important. We started 16, right? But look at this. This is, this is verse 14 for context. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans into the ships over which they rejoice. God is going to sink the Babylon ships. Remember, Egypt did Egypt. Uh, Israel did go into captivity in Babylon. Let's look at the net. This is what the Lord says, your protector, the Holy One of Israel. The Lord, the protector, the Holy One of Israel. This is what he says. For your sake, I send to Babylon and make them all fugitives. I send who? Turning the Babylonians joyful shouts into morning songs. Ah. Look over here at the CSB. Because of you, because of you, Israel. Because it's the Holy One of Israel. Because of you, I'm assuming you're talking about Israel. I will send an army to Babylon. NLT, I will send an army against Babylon, forcing Babylonians to flee in those ships they are so proud of. Okay. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. I assume he's talking to Israel. Uh, Jacob and Israel, right? Uh, Judah. Judah, the southern kingdom, was sent to Babylon. Must be talking to Judah, the southern kingdom. Judah, where? David was from. David has a promise. The Messiah is going to come from his line. Okay. So that's why he wants, he's like, hey, I promised you. And look what I'm going to do now for your sake. I'm going to go and I'm going to beat up them Babylons, Babylonians. I'm the Lord, verse 50, I'm the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Okay. All right. So he's talking about saving them from the Babylonian captivity. Here we go. This is what the Lord says. He who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. So we were just talking about sinking the ships of Babylon. Now Babylon's in the middle of the desert. So I wonder what sinking the ships would mean. Uh, what the Lord says, he who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings out the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man, they will lie, they will lie down and together and not rise again. I think they is the army. So this is what God is saying. God, the okay, the Lord who makes a way through the sea and a path through the waters, that Lord, the Lord who brings out horse and chariot, the mighty man, they all lie down together and will not rise again. They have been extinguished and have gone out like a wick. That God, that's the God. Okay. Behold, I am going to do something new. Now it will spring up. Will you not be aware of it? I, God, I'm going to do something new. Will you, Jacob, Judah, Judah, and Israel, we all not be aware of it? All right? Okay. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. They are in captivity in Babylon. They're in the desert in captivity. But I'm still kind of wondering about this up here. I'm going to type in something. Egypt, baby, lawn. <laughs> Let's see. So now I'm at Bible Gateway, typed in Egypt, Babylon, New Mexico. Okay, 2 Kings, Jeremiah, over Egypt, seek of King of Babylon. I'm looking for something kind of specific. Egypt, so never in Babylon, he will care for wealth. The, the hordes of Babylon will strengthen the king of King of Babylon or Egypt. No longer. I'm going to try something else. No longer Egypt. Egyptians, Exodus, Jeremiah. Here it is. I found it. I thought it was in Isaiah. Jeremiah 23. Ah, ah, Jeremiah 16, 14. In Jeremiah, they're in the Babylonian captivity. They're going to Babylon. They're being taken to the Babylonian captivity. Okay. Um. Nebuchadnezzar is coming to attack. Jeremiah is like, please stop. He's coming to take us to the captivity. And they're like, Jeremiah, quit saying that. He, Jeremiah sends letters to captives already in Babylon. Okay. And people don't like Jeremiah because Jeremiah is saying, hey, God did this. Just chill there. Don't worry. God will save you someday. And the people don't like Jeremiah. Look at this. Therefore, behold, days are coming to close. So this is what ba Jeremiah is telling uh, Israel and uh, Judah. 
Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Egypt out of the land of Babylon. Let's read that. Behold, the days are coming when it is long as you said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Right? Remember, God brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they're like, yay, God brought us out of Egypt. No, no. The days are coming when it will no longer be said, God has brought us out of Egypt. Why? But as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north, Babylon and Assyria, is to the north, but especially Babylon. Jeremiah is. This is Babylon right now. And from all the lands where God had banished them. So we're no longer going to be like, yay, God saved us from Egypt. But instead, God saved us from Babylon. Okay. Uh, down here, full chapter, Jeremiah 23, 7. Um, the same thing. Therefore, the days are coming to close the Lord when it will no longer be say, as the Lord lives, who brought the sons of Israel up from the land of Egypt with Moses. But as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the household of Israel back from the north land, from all the countries where I had driven them. They will then live on their own soil. God is going to bring them back to the land from Babylon. Look over here. This is what the Lord says. He who makes a way through the sea, the Red Sea, and path through the mighty waters, okay, who brings the chariots and the horse, right? Moses and Pharaoh. The mighty men, they will lie down together and not rise. They'll be extinguished. Right. Okay. That's my assumption. Maybe he's talking about just God in general, but maybe he's talking about what he did in, in, uh, in Egypt. Do not call mind to former things or consider things of past. No longer will it be said, the ones who come out of Egypt. Behold, I'm going to do something new. Now it will spring up. Will you not be aware of it? No, I'm going to bring you out of Babylon. Yes. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Yeah. You're, okay, he's going to make the path easy for you. Going to make the path straight. There'll be water to drink. You're going through the desert. It's not, there's going to be a roadway. God's going to bring you back to the land. Look at this. How do I know? I, I looked at this a little earlier. I cheated. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion... We were like those who dream. We were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Right? The Lord has done great things. Restored the fortunes of Zion. When is some times in the fortunes of Zion? Well, not in, when were they not restored? When, what do they need to be restored from? Well, it wouldn't have been from Egypt because they weren't called Zion yet. When are they called Zion? After they're established as a nation under David and Solomon, then they're called Zion. You got a bunch of years of kings, then they get taken away. They're called Zion. The southern kingdom of Judah is called Zion after the reign of King David. If he's going to restore the fortune of Zion, I'm guessing, from Babylonian captivity. They were like, those are dreams. They're, well, yes, we're happy, right? Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things to them. What did the Lord do? Don't call to mind the former things like, it, like, like, like Egypt or, or other former things. Don't consider the past. Those things, I mean, they were good. But what about, behold, I'm doing something new. Dude, you ain't seen nothing yet. You thought me saving you from Egypt was good? You thought me saving? Just watch this when I save you from Babylon. Now it will spring up. We not be aware of it. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The animals of the field will glorify me, the jackals and ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in, in the desert to give to my chosen people, give drink to my chosen people. All right here. The people whom I formed for myself, so they might declare my praise. The people I formed for myself. That is language of the Exodus. God said, I formed a people out of nothing. He said, have you ever, there's a certain passage. Have you ever seen a nation rise overnight? Y'all did. God tells, God tells uh, 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 Israel that when they come out of Egypt. Pretty cool, huh? Now they're coming out of Babylon. It's an even better thing. 
My mouths were filled with laughter, a tongue with chops of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Rahab the harlot. Wait, where did that come from? When they came out of Egypt and they went to, and they went to spy out the land, right? They crossed the Jericho, two of the spies, they go to spy out the land. Rahab hides the spies. The Rahab sees them, right? Let's see. Let's see what Rahab says. Watch this. This is good. Cool chapter. All right. The promise to Rahab. Um, oh, here it is. Here it is. Now, before the spies lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, what did she say to these men? These are men of Israel. These men from, from, from the nation of Israel who have been roaming in the desert for 40 years. They're fixing to come and attack the, uh, the city of Jericho. They're fixing to come take the land of Canaan. Okay. So we're just talking about God bringing them out of Egypt. They're brought out. God's fixing to give them their own land. What does Rahab say to them? Open parentheses. Here's where Rahab starts talking. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have despaired because of you. Why would they despair? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before when he came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, the Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard these reports, our hearts melted and had no courage remain in anyone longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, he is God in heaven above and on earth above. Rahab and the people heard the great things the Lord had done for them. They dried up the herd that they, he dried up the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh. Heard that he defeated armies for Egypt. I mean, for Israel. Rahab heard about that. What's it say over here? The Lord has done great. The nation was filled with laughter. Our mouths are filled with laughter. Our tongues with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, not just among Rahab, among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nation. Either A, God was going to make them a light. This just came to me. By them doing and following his law. Or B, if God has to punish them and then save them to be like, I'm an awesome God. I'm not going to let them get away with stuff, but I'm going to save the people I love. Pretty cool. That's what he did with Egypt. And now that's what he's doing out of the Babylonian captivity. Okay, here we go. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. Water. Lots of water in symbolism. Water up here. Water in the desert. Water down here. In the Negev. Negev means southern land, I believe. You can fact check me on that one. Let's see. Negev. 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 Wikipedia is a desert in semi-desert southern Israel. The region's largest city of oh, Beersheba. Beersheba, that's a Bible word. Yeah. Large southern. Okay. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Oh, look at this. Spelled Negev, Hebrew Ha Negev, also called the Southland. Okay, pretty cool. Oh, hey, gotquestions.org, pretty good uh, site. Um, if you're Methodist, if, if you're not Reformed, that's okay. Got Questions is a more Reformed theologically website, but they're very fair and basic Bible questions. They're mostly rather fair. What's the significance of the Negev in the Bible? We can read that. Yeah. Say, so, hey, go look that up. Oh, uh, yeah. Bible Atlas. Look that. Okay. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the water courses in Negev. Restore our fortunes. Like, Lord, those water courses in the Negev, restore our fortunes like those. And what does he say up here in Isaiah? He's going to. Pretty cool. May the Lord, may those who sow in tears reap shouts of joy. You need to repent, right? Several times, God's like, mourn, repent, be sorrow over your sins. Then you'll have joy. Then I will see your sorrow and I will come and save you. That's what happens in the past several times. The book of Judges, over and over again, they fail, they cry and repent, and God saves them. They fail, they cry and repent, and God saves them. Happens to kings of Israel who are wicked kings, even. God's like, I'll save them because they, look at that. So in tears of joy, reap shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying the sheaves. There's a little uh, little play of uh, um, mixed metaphors. We're talking about 
water up here. Um, God's going to give us water in the desert, you know, met metaphorically, God's going to provide for us even in dry places. And down here, during harvest time, we're going to go out and sow tears of joy. But what are we going to reap? We're going to come with shouts of joy, carrying sheaves. So 12, 126 verse 5, 126 verse 6, those are meant to go together. Well, those who sow tears and may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing seed for sowing, sowing tears, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying sheaves, reap with shouts of joy. Pretty cool, huh? I guess you could then talk about, hey, let's talk about the harvest time of Israel. Let's talk about the festivals where you get God your first fruits and that. But we've been talking about how, okay, you reap what you sow. There's in Galatians, right? You do something bad. You're going to sow something bad. Okay. You do something good, such as weeping, bearing seeds for sowing. You sow in tears. You sow repentance. You sow sorrowfulness. Lord, I'm sorry. What are you going to get? Shouts of joy. You're going to come carrying the sheaves. God's good to you. Okay, now let's read Philippians and John. Let's see if the Old Testament readings. If what we've gleaned, no pun intended, what we've gleaned, so sowing and gleaning, you know, gleaning, you walk behind the, the sowers and you pick up the, um, the stuff that they drop. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Um, look at my Ruth Bible study around the, the chapter two, you know, talk a lot about gleaning, about reaping and sowing. All right. Over at YouTube. Search BJ Very Basic Bible. If you go to YouTube and you type in BJ Very Basic Bible, you'll find Very Basic Bible videos. Yeah. All right. Flipping circuit. Let's see. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Okay. Philippians is a letter Paul is writing to a church in Philippi, and he's writing it from jail. Paul's in jail. He's writing to the church of Philippi. He seems to have a very good relation with them. He names some of them by name. He says, I was with you. I'm very thankful for the gift you gave me. He names one of his people. He says, hey, Epaphras, Epaphroditus um, was very, now I got to go look it up. He was sick, but you helped him. You cared for him. You sent him back to me. Thank you, Philippians. Epaphroditus, is that how you spell it? Oh, let me spell it. Oh, hey, look at Timothy and Epaphroditus. Good, good, good. So it was Epaphroditus. Okay. Awesome. God, uh, uh, Paul, when you read Philippians, has a very, um, a rather uh, close relations with the Philippians. All right. If anyone has, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Hmm. Why is he going to give confident? Why is he going to start? If anyone has confident in the flesh, has reason to be confident, I have more. I have more confident. I have more reason to be confident in the flesh. In the flesh? Paul talks about the flesh being bad. You want to walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You want to satisfy the desires of the spirit, not the flesh. Paul says, I worship God with my mind, but I give over to the flesh sometimes, you know? Paul, Paul talks about that, right? So why is he going to, why does he want reason to be confident in the flesh? Okay. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin. These are all the reasons Paul has to be confident in the flesh. A Hebrew born of Hebrews as to the Pharisee law of Pharisee. This dude circumcised. This dude's a member of Israel. Benjamin. Hebrew, born of Hebrews, a lot. I mean, he knows his genealogy here. He's a Pharisee. He can boast that he can say, hey, I don't need to have faith. I have works. As to zeal, persecuted the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Man, this guy is. Let's look up Philippians 3. I always misspell Philippians. I've got two P's or one. Yep, two P's. Here we go. Oh. Three. Let's see why in the world is she starting to brag on himself seemingly. Okay. Three, four. Okay. 
Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to keep telling you to rejoice. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Oh, Jewish people. False circumcision are Jewish brothers. I mean, uh, his, his Jewish kin who are like, who say Jesus is not the Messiah. Who work against the cause of Christ. That's what Paul was doing, right? He circumcised, but he was he was working against Christ. Look at this. For we, the Christians, are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, take pride in Christ Jesus. We don't take pride in ourselves and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself could boast as having more confidence even in the flesh. Ah, Beware of the people who put confidence in the flesh. Okay? Beware of them. We are the true circumcision. We take our pride in Christ, not in our flesh. And hey, okay, okay. Look at this. Let's go back. So if anyone, if anyone else does have reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. I bet Paul's getting at something. Circumcised on the eighth day, member of the people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But he just said he wants to take pride, not in all that stuff. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. Whatever I had. I count as lost because of Christ. Look at this. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the path of the mighty waters, who brings out chariots, horse, and quickly they lie down. The, the, the chariots lie down. The horse are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider things of old. Whatever I had, I'm about to do a new thing. I count as lost for Jesus Christ. What they had in the past was good, maybe. It's probably good. Paul doesn't say the law is bad. God never said me bringing you out of Egypt or me rescuing you in the past from enemies in the past is bad. But compared to this new thing, dude, I'm bringing you up from Babylon. That old stuff might as well. Don't even remember it. Okay, be happy. You go out weeping. You come with shouts of joy. What you, what you did in the past is considered weeping compared to carrying the sheaves, shouts of joy. Whatever gains I did have, Paul in Romans says, hey, the law is holy, righteous, and good. Paul says that. Paul says, hey, Israel, you think y'all aren't so good? Dude, y'all have the oracles of God. Paul says that in Romans chapter 3. Mm -hmm. The law is holy, righteous, good. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that. I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything I regard as lost because of the surpassing value. God, Jesus Christ is knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, is so great. Everything in the past is rubbish. For his sake, I have suffered loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Circumcised the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, of a persecutor of the church, righteousness under the law, blameless. Look at this. I want to be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. That's old stuff. But one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. That's the new stuff. The Lord brought him out of Zion, back, is bringing back to Zion. He's like those who seen. The Lord has done great things for Paul. That's what he wants. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, he's getting a little deeper there. He's saying, I want to know Christ. How am I going to know Christ? I'm going to be in his death. So I may attain the resurrection. The death is the old thing. The resurrection is a new. The death of Christ is a good and wonderful thing. The death in Christ, the best thing ever. His atonement for our blood. 
the shedding of blood for the remission of our sins. He died for our, let's see, Romans 4. Transgressions. Look at this. Therefore, it was also called, credited to him as righteousness. Okay. Abraham's faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Now, not for Abraham's sake only was it written that it was credited to him up here. Uh, those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is called the father of us, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations. In the presence of God, who Abraham believed, that is God who gives life to the dead, who calls things out of being that do not exist. Okay, this is the God Abraham serves and hope against hope. Abraham believed so he might become the father of many nations. He wasn't a father. Now he's the father of many nations, man. I can see a theme starting here. Is this the theme the lectionary was giving us? I'm not sure, but it's a wonderful theme. Behold, the old things are past. New things come. This is great. Without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead since Abraham was about 100 years old and the deadness of sarah's womb she was like 90 yet with respect to the promise of god what was the old thing his body abraham's dead womb as sarah's dead womb yet with respect to the promise of god he did not waver in unbelief but grew just strong in faith giving glory to god and being fully assured that what god had promised he was able to perform therefore it was also credit to him, to him as righteousness yes the old Let's say over here. Um, the Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoice. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue. When the Lord restored the fortune of Zion, they were in Babylon. They said, I love you, Lord. Uh oh, what's it? Do not remember the former things or consider things of old. No, no, no. Don't do that. Don't consider your old, dead, barren womb. Abraham was as good as dead. His body was old. I'm about to do a new thing. Trust in the promise of God. And what was my point originally, okay? Now, for Abraham's sake only, was it written that it was credited to him? It was not only written for Abraham's sake, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. If we believe, we'll also be credited with righteousness. Jesus, who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justification. Delivered for our wrongdoings, for our trespasses, for our sins. Raised for the forgiveness of our, those sins, for our justification, for our righteousness. Where is it at? I want to know Christ. Oh, I want to know Christ and the power Want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death. He died for our trespasses. If I somehow may attain the resurrection from the dead, Jesus rose for our justification. We're with Christ. We die. We come back to life with Christ. Did God go with them into exile? He did. Jeremiah said, hey, live in exile. God will prosper you there. God will bring you out of exile. That was Jeremiah. Isaiah said he's the God. I think that might be a good study to do. Did God go with them when they went into exile? I say, of course he did. God has to be with them. In Ezekiel, there's a valley of dry bones. God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, hey, only you know, Lord. Then God makes them come to life. Where were the dead bones? They were dead in Babylon. The nation of Egypt was in Babylon dead. God blew on them and they came alive. God went to where they were. God goes with them in exile. Then he comes back and brings them back from exile. Yeah. We, where's that? I want to know the power of his resurrection, the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death. If I may retain to the resurrection from the dead. Right here, 312. Not that I have already obtained this or I've already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So, so this, God does it, you do it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. 
Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. I haven't done it yet. I haven't obtained it just yet. I haven't made it my own. But this thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forget what was behind. Go to what lays ahead. Okay? I haven't reached a goal. I'm going to reach it. I'm, I'm working towards it. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. That's awesome. Yes. God is bringing him back. And he's saying he's going to keep bringing me back. I'm John 8. I read this earlier. Let's see if we can take the same theme we've had. Okay. Forget the old. God is doing something new. And we're going to keep pressing on and keep doing something new. Okay. Let's see. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. One saying, guys. Take my swig of Gatorade, no water. Remember, guys, if I've been going kind of quickly, and gals, guys and gals, remember, if I've been going kind of quickly, and I haven't been looking up too much scripture like I do in other very basic Bible videos, I'm trying to take what we've already learned in the past from very basic Bible videos, or let's say you've been to church your whole life. Let's say you run your own Bible study. You've learned, you say you've even been to seminary. We're trying to take your already, your, your already gained knowledge and now applying it to stud, to actual study. Now you can study very meticulously, but here we're going a little quicker. Some of you might be thinking, you're not going quick at all. You're being painstaking, you know, you're being pedantic. You're looking, if you think this, if, if those of you who are thinking, BJ, you are taking a long time and being very de excruciatingly detailed, if that's what you think, I dare you to go watch some of our very basic Bible study longs or the Ruth Bible study. Yeah, the Micah chapter one Bible study. Yeah, I dare you to go watch some of those. All right, here we go. Okay. One second, guys. All right. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Lazarus, Bethany, oh, oh Lazarus gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. The hymn is Jesus. So they're giving Jesus dinner. Martha's serving him dinner. Lazarus is chilling at the table eating dinner. Mary, so there's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You go back and you read, uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Mary and Martha are his brothers. Yeah, so Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, what did Jesus say? Mary just poured all that ointment on him. Lazarus is eating dinner with him. Martha's serving dinner. Mary pours all the ointment. What did Judas say? Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? That doesn't sound too bad, does it? That doesn't sound too bad. Now, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept a common purse and he used to steal what was put into it. So we don't give Judas any credit whatsoever, zero credit. But giving money to the poor, not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so she might keep it for the day of my burial. Hmm. So Jesus didn't say, leave her alone, Judas, you're lying. Leave her alone. She bought the perfume, I'm guessing. She bought it so she might keep it for the day of my burial. You have, always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Let's go look this up. John 12. Some of that wording in the New Revised Standard Version is kind of, uh, kind of, kind of foreign to some people's ears. That's kind of, you know, leave her alone. She bought. Okay, let's, let's see. Let's go to the NIV. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. The NIV is a little easier reading, so. They came to Bethany, Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. 
So it doesn't necessarily say he was at, oh, here, the home of Lazarus. Hmm. Let's see, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. So maybe he went to uh, Lazarus' home, maybe not. He, here, dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Okay, they're trying to honor Jesus. Martha served. If Martha served, it probably was at their house. Probably was at Lazarus' house. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, you know. Maybe, maybe Martha and Mary showed up at the house where they were at, Martha serving. Okay. While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So they're at this big dinner, got lots of people. Well, I say lots of people. The dinner is held in honor of Jesus, at least. Then Mary took about a pint of pure and art and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped her, his feet with her hair. The fragrance was, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Okay, it's in, it's in honor of Jesus. She's doing something good for Jesus. So, hey, Jesus is pro underdog. I've always said that. Okay, sure. She could have said, Jesus, I would give this to you. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you by selling it and giving the money to the poor. Jesus would have probably said, awesome. Way to go, Mary. You know, Jesus would have been sad. No, no, no. Give it to us and let us sell it. So that he could swipe some, you know. When he said 300 denarii. Maybe, maybe he knew it was worth like 400, and that's why he said 300. Because, I mean, if he's going to steal from the purse, hey, what happened? I thought we had 300. There's only 250 in here. Oh, I don't know. I guess some, huh? some of it must have fallen out. <clears throat> yeah. Judas says this. He's like, he's, he's sporting his like brand new robe, you know. Um, <laughs> it costs 50 denarii. Okay. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money, as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. We were just talking about burial, right? Is this the day Jesus dies? No, no. He's still got a few more days. The day of means, like, like some people say, my, at one point Jesus says, my hour has come. Father, should I, should, should I ask you to save me from this hour? No. You sent me for this exact hour. Jesus doesn't die that hour. It's still a few hours later before he dies. And then it's like, what, uh, many, many hours later until he raises that exact hour, you know. Um, Paul, uh, John says, my children, it is the last hour. You know, he doesn't mean like this is last hour, because then when he writes that letter, he knows John, the apostle. He writes in the book of first John, this is the last hour. When he writes the letter, he delivers it in order to get it to people and to other churches. He knows it's going to take more than an hour. This is the last hour. What if what if he wasn't finished writing the letter until 30 minutes later? Oh, I've only got 30 minutes. Her get, no, no, no. It's, a you know. The day of the Lord, this day, this hour, you know, uh, Paul says, I die daily. He does daily, right? Every day. But here, uh, uh, Hebrews talks about that day, the day you're saved. Jesus is talking about this day, the day of my burial. So the time of my burial, when, you know, you know, otherwise he'd have had to say, no, Martha, don't put on my feet yet. Wait for a few days whenever I'm dead, then come to the tomb. Now they did try to go to the tomb and it was empty, you know. Y'all get what I'm saying here. It's a metaphor. Now I'm starting to get into it. Okay. She should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Don't help the poor, but help me. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the old thing is... I think, you know, God does something old and now does something new. I'm not sure exactly how to apply it. I'm kind of trying, I'm kind of thinking like the new thing is Jesus. So don't focus on the poor. Are the poor the old thing? Well, I mean, not necessarily old, but what's better? Focusing on the poor or focusing on Jesus who then helps all the poor. Kind of like, Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man a fish to fish. Teach a man to fish, feed him for his life. My boss is texting me from work, work at my church. 
you know, he's like, hey guys. <laughs> um, kind of like that. The poor, that the old thing, maybe just just helping people of your under your own power, right? Abraham's body was as good as dead. Uh, uh, Israel, they went into the captivity. Okay. How are they brought out? God brings them out. We were like one with shouts of joy. The Lord has done great things for us. Paul says, I used to work for it, but now I'm trusting in Christ. Here, hey, let's give money to the poor. No, no, no. I am fixing to be buried. Focus on me. Don't focus on the poor. Don't focus on your prayer life. Don't focus on uh, uh, doing good things. No, no, no. Focus on me. Jesus said, look to me. Everything else will, will take care of itself. Okay. Paul said the law is holy and righteous and good. But it can be used bad. Look that through the lens of Jesus. The law is beautiful points us to our sin which drives us further to jesus everything's driving us to jesus it's all about jesus right here give the money to the poor you're focusing on the poor not jesus i but put perfume on jesus and you're focusing on jesus and jesus will help the poor is this is this it is this what jesus is saying the old and the new thing some of you might be like no that's not it you know that can't be it no i'm not I'm not very sure you know I mean, I'm sure. I think whether or not that's why the lectionary was put together this way. They put the lectionary, the four lectionary readings together. They try to theme them together. I've In the past, I've read like these three things in the lectionary. Now this one's completely different. And here's what, and I've always been like, but wait, wait. They put them together to relate to each other. I think, but they also put them together because it's almost Easter, right? It's almost a time of year where we celebrate. The Lent is a time of year when we celebrate up to Jesus' death. Easter, you know, Good Friday, we celebrate his death. Easter Sunday, we celebrate his resurrection. So we're on our way there, okay? So right here, Jesus is focusing on the burial. That's the old thing. The poor you will always have with you. The me you will not always have with you. The old thing is the burial. The new, no, maybe, maybe we could say that the old thing is the poor. The new thing is Jesus. Now, Jesus is saying, we need to focus on my burial. That's the old thing. Does he tell us what's going to happen? He's going to be raised? No, but that is the new thing. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. See what you can draw out of this, right? You can draw this stuff. Lazarus was dead. Jesus raised him. Martha served Jesus, uh, served Jesus like the food and such. Mary anointed Jesus. Is that, is that it? Is that a parallel? I'm not sure. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, Martha is serving Jesus. Mary is learning from Jesus. Martha complains, look, I'm serving you and slaving. Mary says, hey, and then Jesus says, Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing, me, my teaching. Martha, you're worried about serving me, and which is good. Mary's worried about learning from me, which is better. Maybe, maybe something like that. You know, you can play with it. Play with it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and... Uh, and escape, stop, share. Go ahead and call this to a close. Yeah, go ahead and say, that's pretty good, huh? Not so bad. I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has uh, opened your mind to the scriptures, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm like Paul. I, I, I know that as I write, you can see my insights into the mystery of God. No, no, no. I hope, I hope, God, has, I hope God has illuminated our hearts, okay? If you're preaching a Sunday, if you're teaching a Sunday, if you're like, oh, no, I need the lectionary stuff, here you go. If, if you're just looking for more, hey, BJ, we've learned a lot of Bible study stuff. Now let's put it in action. There we go. We just did. All right, guys, let's pray real quick. We'll be out of here. Lord God, wonderful God, beautiful God, awesome God that destroys the old and births out the new. 
the God who tears down the old and builds up the new. Yes, Lord, tear down our old self, build up our new self. Lord, let us die with you so we might rise with you. And let us keep pressing on to the goal. Abraham kept trusting. Paul said, I strive towards that goal. Let us keep going, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross, for rising for our sins, for going to heaven and reigning and ruling forever on earth. Amen. See you guys on another Very Basic Bible.